William Gallagher, known in North Texas as Doc, was a Christian radio host and speaker. He also was the author of Jesus Christ Money Master. In 2019, he added convicted felon to his resume after being sentenced to 25 years in prison for defrauding at least $29 million out of elderly victims in a Ponzi scheme. How did Doc steal from his victims? Can the authorities use one of Doc's books to locate the missing million? And what did the scheme have to do with religion. After serving in the Peace Corps in Thailand during the 1960s, Doc attended Brown University to get his PhD in philosophy. However, this field of study seemed like an odd choice for the next stage of his life, Wall Street. It's unclear why Doc chose to work on Wall Street with a philosophy degree being the highlight of his resume, but investigators believe these claims by Doc to be true. Doc's reason for having his finance job after five years was the firm's emphasis on numbers instead of people. So Doc took his talents to Texas, specifically Dallas, where he would recreate himself in a new image that he later dubbed the Money Doctor. If you attended Doc's seminars before the FBI arrested him, you would be given an informative pamphlet filled with convincing evidence indicating that Doc knows what he's talking about. Right off the bat, you're shown how important Doc is in the conservative Christian community. On the front of the pamphlet, there are several pictures of Doc shaking hands with Governor Mike Huckabee, former Texas Governor Rick Perry, and megachurch owner Joel Osteen. The image are authentic and give the impression that Doc is someone famous and successful people trust. So why not give him your money? In addition to giving his listeners unconventional financial advice, Doc also claimed to run an investment fund that boasted 5-9% to annual return, which is 1% below the average yearly return of the SP500 index fund, America's most popular and steady place to invest capital. Doc's numbers look pretty average for a Ponzi schemer, so how is he able to lure in so many people with such a run-of-the-mill return? As his book, Jesus Christ, Christ Money Master indicates, Doc enticed his elderly victims with something more spiritual than return rate. Larry Burdain was born and raised in Texas, graduated from the University of Texas in Austin, and worked a high-level job at Texas Instruments. As you can see, Larry is an educated and highly educated Texan. Nevertheless, Larry fell for Doc's scheme like so many others. His first impression of Doc was initially not a good one, but over time, Larry warmed up enough to Doc to give him his entire IRA. Larry's relationship with Doc began when his mother-in-law gave Doc $50,000 to invest with. From there, Larry, still skeptical, recalls waiting to see what happened to his mother-in-law's money while in the hands of the money doctor. Everything Doc promised Larry's mother-in-law came true. To supposedly prove that her money was growing, Doc sent Larry's mother-in-law a quarterly bonus check prompting Larry to dig deeper into Doc's operation. Larry set up a meeting with the money doctor in his corporate office to get a better feel for Doc's integrity. Looking out for anything sketchy, Larry didn't find anything concerning when visiting Doc's company HQ. Instead, Larry walked away feeling more sure of Doc's legitimacy. However, Larry didn't fully trust Doc until a heart attack sent him to the hospital. While seeking treatment, Larry was visited by two doctors, a specialist and the money doctor. Doc walks into Larry's room and finds out that he needs surgery to fix his heart. From there, Larry recalls Doc getting down on his knees and praying alongside Larry for a successful operation and speedy recovery. The prayers worked. After his surgery, Larry handed over his entire IRA to Doc. Charles Charles first encountered Doc at a lunch seminar when the money doctor was speaking. Charles was a retired police officer, and his wife had been recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's. With hundreds of thousands in savings and nothing but medical bills to spend it on, the couple was looking for someone to help manage the money for the next stage of their life. Initially, Charles invested in another fund Doc recommended during their consultation. In 2004, Doc sent them a letter that said, there is a better way. Charles and his wife believed Doc and handed over a portion of their savings. They began on the basic plan. However, when Charles' wife passed away from Alzheimer's, Doc convinced him to invest the rest of his savings. If he didn't, Charles would miss out on a rare opportunity to ride some particularly high rates of return. After the death of his wife, Charles had a total of $400,000 invested in Doc's fund. Susan Pippi, on the other hand, had even more money on the line. Pippi suffered from lymphoma and decided to invest $675,000 in Doc's fund. She, like so many others, presumed her money was safe with Doc. Doc first introduced himself to Susan when her lymphoma hit its peak. According to Pippi, she thought she would die soon, and in comes the doc to offer her comfort in the form of prayer and solid investment opportunities. However, on March 14th, 2019, Pippi, Larry, and Charles received news that their money manager had been arrested for security fraud. Larry first heard the news while vacationing in Italy. His mother-in-law called him crying about how Doc was being handcuffed by the FBI. Whether they were in Italy or Dallas, Doc's victims spent the days after March 14th looking 
for their retirement money. Where did the money go? And how did Doc Gallagher trick that many people into giving him their savings? Throughout Doc's scam, he never once held a license to invest other people's money. He was never certified by the SEC, nor was he licensed through FINRA, both of which are the minimum requirements for anyone to become a legitimate financial advisor in the United States. Instead, Doc insisted on his certifications through radio advertisements, and the stations never considered checking his credentials. If you hear a lie enough, it becomes the truth. And after enough advertisements filled the ears of local Fort Worth, Dallas residents, the reputation stuck until Doc's arrest. Despite being different people with varying backgrounds, many of Doc's victims, especially the three mentioned earlier, share strikingly similar traits. They are all older individuals suffering from poor health or were married to someone who did. They had reason to fear loneliness and Doc preyed on them. These individuals were vulnerable to someone like Doc who took the time to send them letters and make them feel important enough to gain their trust. The strategy is embodied in Doc's book, The Money Doctor's Guide to Taking Care of Yourself When No One Else Will. Jerry Walsh, an expert on financial scams like Doc's Ponzi scheme, refers to this manipulation strategy as a type of social obligation. Doc's victims felt obligated to give them their hard-earned money after the friendly way he treated them. Doc sent his victims cards and prayed for them, making them feel obligated to return the favor at some point. Another social obligation Doc exploited was his victim's religion. Through his books and compassionate prayers, Gallagher communicated to Christians that he could be trusted as a man of God and not just a financial guru. Doc's use of religion to bilk money out of vulnerable individuals is similar to the infamous televangelists who, even today, use spiritual marketing tactics to raise millions to fund the purchases of private jets and Italian sports cars. Unlike televangelists, however, Doc kept a low profile and didn't flaunt his wealth. Instead, Doc opted for a more wholesome small-town pastor image that paired well with his word-of-mouth marketing strategy. To keep the mouths moving, Doc kept paying out quarterly bonuses to clients who, in turn, told their friends and family all about how amazing the money doctor is at investing. As you can probably guess, Doc funded these nifty quarterly bonuses with prior investors' money, which is where the scam turns into a textbook Ponzi scheme. Generally speaking, Ponzi schemes work on a rob Peter to pay Paul model. Doc's company invested very little, meaning that most of the missing funds were used to pay new investors quarterly bonuses like the ones Larry mother-in-law received. What about the money Doc didn't use? Authorities only found a little over $800,000 in Doc's private bank account. A small fraction of the missing $29 million, the team tasked with managing the confiscated $800K plans to reimburse Doc's victims $0.08 cents for every dollar they invested. Authorities speculate that in the coming years, as they dig up more information into Doc's scheme, the investigation will yield more stolen money. The highest estimation comes in at around $100 million. As of 2021, investigators estimate that Doc built 200 victims. Authorities seized the storage building along with all of Doc's accounts and assets. However, based on some unorthodox evidence, authorities might know where Doc hid the money. Doc more or less already gave authorities a clue into where the money might be. One of his money management books, Doc advised his clients to stash their money like any God-fearing, fiscally responsible American should in offshore Caribbean accounts. Specifically, Doc recommended the Bahamas. He bragged about how wise he is for putting the money into offshore accounts. Though Doc lied about many aspects of his business, investigators believe these boasts will lead them to the lost fund. If that's the case, Doc's investigation is just beginning. While investigators continue sifting through evidence, some of Doc's victims are searching for their funds by personally asking him where the money is. Susan Pippi is the victim who gave Doc $675,000, wrote a letter to the money doctor in 2019 pleading with him to tell investigators where he hid everyone's money. Surprisingly, the money doctor wrote back. In a handwritten letter, Doc sent this helpful note to his former client, which starts out friendly as Doc says, quote, I am glad you wrote. I really do understand how you feel. Keep writing and expressing whatever you want. But the letter turns dark. When Doc writes, if I could get out of here, I would gladly visit you face to face to give you the details of what has happened. They won't let me speak to clients until the trial is over. No surprise here. The way it has been characterized in the media is false. I look forward to seeing you. Then he signed the letter Doc, a name that used to carry prestige in North Texas. Click here to watch one of these next videos.